see, all behavior is learned behavior. So we need tools to unlearn the negative behavior or if we want to change some sort of behavior that's blocking us from achieving our ultimate potential in life, then hypnosis is that tool. It's uh, allowing your mind to do what you want to do and you controlling that and not allowing it to control it for you. I can't hijack your brain. I can't, I can't get inside the brain. Uh, I can do certain things to make you suggestible. That's what advertisers, the media, politicians, they understand the power of words and suggestion and suggestibility, and they utilize that in their favor. This is a phenomenon. It's a natural organic process. So we go all the way back to the beginning of time where the applications of trance-like states or hypnosis were utilized. You have the ability to control people's brains? Um, not necessarily in that um, sentence structure. In that <laughs> <context>. <laughs> okay, that's fine. But uh, yes, <laughs> if they want me to control their brains. And that's what this uh, modality is really about. It's about really, uh, see, all behaviors learn behavior. So we need tools to unlearn the negative behavior or if we want to change some sort of behavior that's blocking us from achieving our ultimate potential in life, then hypnosis is that tool. So it seems like there's this element of consent that's really important to hypnosis. Where Very good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you have to have permission. See, it doesn't work like you see in the movies or television. Uh, you know, I can't go to the bank and just hypnotize all of the tellers and put the money in my car and speed off. It, just, it, just, it doesn't work that way. Because, you have to work for a living. Because the government will come after you or because it doesn't work unless someone is willing to be hypnotized? Correct. You have to have their consent and they have to agree to allow me as the guide or the facilitator to take you through this journey, this process uh, of the mind. Now, is there any danger whatsoever of somebody doing a sort of uh, hijacking people's brains without them knowing about it? Um, you know, that's a that's that's a common question, and I get that all of the time. Um, it's kind of a two part. So let me give you the the first answer, the simple answer, which is, I can't hijack your brain. I can't I can't get inside the brain. Uh, I can do certain things to make you suggestible. That's what advertisers, the media, politicians, they understand the power of words and suggestion and suggestibility, and they utilize that in their favor. Um, now, hijacking, there is a brainwashing process, and this is what they used back in the 70s or the mm -hmm. Vietnam era, where they basically brainwashed uh, soldiers and how they did that was sleep deprivation, uh, food, a lot of different things to allow them to become highly suggestible to what was really happening in their surroundings. Drugs <laughs> too, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Is if you there... watch a movie called The uh, Manchurian Candidate, mm. it's kind of based on, on those concepts. Is there any precedent for governments hiring hypnotists to help them out with this stuff? No, absolutely not. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the courts up until just recently, I know in Texas, there was an organization of hypnotists who they were basically training law enforcement and others to go in and testify in court of law. Well, that currently disbanded uh, because that particular state decided that they didn't want to allow that. It's the same thing in California and most states. Uh, they just don't allow the testimony of hypnosis and or someone under hypnosis mm. to, to do that any longer. But it was um, it was it was widely used uh, just a few years ago. And that's because people who have been hypnotized aren't reliable witnesses. No, it's because they they think that uh, the hypnotist is is giving suggestion or memory implants to sway the testimony. Hmm. And this kind of comes down to the idea where if you're doing hypnotherapy or anything that's to do with regression into the past, there is criticism that it could be implanting false memories. 
Correct. Very good. Yes. And that's exactly what the courts have ruled. And so therefore, that's why they don't allow, which is very, very powerful because there's memory recall. There's all kinds of things that can happen uh, to help the trial or the testimony in that particular case. But that's where they're at with it right now, because they just don't quite understand it completely and totally. And, and, and honestly, you know, I've been doing this for 26 years. Um, even the scientists and myself, this is a phenomenon. It's a natural organic process that it's, it's so hard to describe and to really put into words to have a, a, a complete understanding of it. We know it works <laughs> and that's, and that's what we do now. And so I've been doing this a long time, seeing many different changes in people's lives with the applications of it and helping people to get to that point. Yes, absolutely. So how do you define hypnotism? Yeah, well, it's pretty simple. All help, hypnosis is self-hypnosis. We go in and out of it about a thousand times a day. It's a natural state. It really is. Uh, common forms uh, when you're up on the highway, freeway, or in your case, driving along in your spaceship and you realize that your exit was three exits back somewhere or your planet was three exits back somewhere. Uh, that's a form of hypnosis. So the Spacing out. Spacing out. Yeah, there you go. Just kind of be, being in the zone, uh, sitting in a classroom, not paying attention to the teacher. Uh, maybe some people watching this program really are all of a sudden zoning out because that's the hypnotic state and that's the true form of it. And it's a very receptive state. Is that the idea? Yes. Yes, so you're absolutely. more likely to sort of integrate certain pieces of information into your consciousness or into your perception? Yes, absolutely, positively. I see you've both done your research on this. Good for you. Well, so, yes. we have big plans for, you know, what we're going to do all the earthlings when we get there. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. And I'm going to help you do that. Exactly. Wow. So I'm an accomplice now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure she doesn't do anything too evil. We'll see. Uh, yeah, I, I yeah. It, even if she tried, it couldn't be up. It, it wouldn't happen. Yeah, it take a lot of work to get to do or persuade. Again, all that stuff you hear—the sensationalism in the movies, television—that's uh, just not how it works. It's just not possible to achieve those levels of that. Now you see that in a comedy stage hypnosis show where it seems like the hypnotist is in complete control and anything he suggests to those particular people, they automatically do. But that's not the case whatsoever either. Is, can, is that from picking the audience really well or? Well, there's a lot going on there. There's psychology. There's, uh, you know, a good showman understands his audience. Uh, he picks people and understands who he's going to have on his stage or he adapts very quickly to his surroundings of what is happening or the personalities of the individuals who are there. So a good stage hypnotist like myself, because I do both, I do clinical hypnotherapy and I also do comedy stage hypnotism. <laughs> As you can see behind me is uh, some pretty famous, uh, those are original posters. Uh, so you have a movie poster, you have the great jester who was uh, very popular in the 1800s doing comedy stage hypnotism. And as you can see, possibly some of the things there, they got a guy sawing on a chair and there's some different other things from that period of what people <laughs> found. So it's a very traditional <laughs> art form. Oh, absolutely. It's been around for a long time. Uh, uh, the word hypnosis was coined by a dentist. Uh, Braid was his name. And Franz Anton Mesmer was basically the father of hypnosis, where he was demonstrating with that and got all the way into Freud. And they were demonstrating and, and uh, trying to figure this stuff out and help people to help themselves. Yes. Hmm. What are the main yeah. ingredients of entering into a hypnotic state? You say that it happens all the time to people as they're walking around, standing in line, zoning out, spacing out, whatever. Is yeah. there some common theme to all people or is it unique from person to person what will trigger that kind of state well every individual is different in how they receive it so everyone may have a different feeling but there is a commonality that runs through once you get into a hypnotic state and again it's just like you're saying it's it's getting into that zone or that where your mind just goes somewhere else and you're not really focused or 
coherent where where you are right now. <laughs> it's really interesting that humans have evolved this state of mind. Like if you want to think of it as some sort of, there must be an adaptive advantage to that of some sort. Not that you're a biologist or anything, but it's quite fascinating that this would just be available in an animal. Yeah. Oh, can you hypnotize a dog? Yes, actually. Whoa. Animal hypnotism is very common and was utilized in demonstrations back again in the 1800s or early 1900s mm. of how hypnosis would work uh, and with people as well. Because they thought it was magnetism at, at first where they were using magnets and trying to hypnotize and then the energy and the blood flow would be responsive to that. Well, they discovered that it's really the mind that's doing it and here we are today with all the advancements of this technology or this modality. It's, again, a mm. natural organic resource. And so, again, all you have to do is tap into it and allow the process to work for you. Is there any record of this prior to the modern era? Was there any ancient application of this sort of work? Oh, or was it just sort of rolled into the religion burrito? Or Religion burrito. Uh <laughs> Yummy. You never had one of those? I've uh, never had one. <laughs> Sounds delicious. <laughs> However, uh, yes, you can go all the way back to biblical time mm. where Christ himself talks about trans states in the Bible. Mm. It's in scripture. So we go all the way back to Adam and Eve and from the beginning of time where the applications of trance like states or hypnosis were utilized. Absolutely. And they're utilized for good. All for good, absolutely. There's, it can never be for 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 evil. Although, like anything else, uh, people have tried to use it for evil. Uh, it does get categorized into the occult category anytime it comes up, and this is where the skeptics and the cynics get really, uh, you know, fueled with their fire because that's the stereotype of what what is, and that's why TV, movies, books use that sensationalism to bring it to that point because that's what people want to see. It's romanticized. And you mentioned the Manchurian candidate. Is it your opinion that that's completely ridiculous and you well, couldn't actually successfully reprogram absolutely. someone without um, their permission? Absolutely. You could. Mm. Absolutely. You could. Yes. That's tantalizing. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 don't get me <laughs> don't hypnotize me <laughs> uh who's to say i haven't done it or that's true that's true i yeah. noticed i was feeling pretty good there for a second yeah, yeah what are the ingredients that are necessary do you have to have eye contact do you have to have yeah. direct contact or or can it just happen because something that i wonder all the time is there's a certain uh, trance like quality to a lot of the stuff that comes out of Hollywood. Yes. And again, that's the sensationalism of it or what they want to stereotype a hypnotist to be. Notice I didn't bring my watch today. I didn't bring a hypno disc <laughs> or spiral. I didn't bring any tools to actually hypnotize you. I'm not using, uh, you know, a deep monotone voice. I'm not staring deeply into your eyes. These things although they can be utilized to facilitate trance state, but this is not how we do it. Hypnosis is done with words, and it's a sentence structure that we, we put together, which mm. takes the mind into that relaxed state. Once the mind is into a relaxed state, then we can talk directly to the subconscious mind, which is the 88% of your brain's capacity. That's where all the information is stored of where it is positive or negative, and so therefore, we talk to the subconscious mind, but you have to be willing and wanting to allow that to be, again, I'm just the guide. I don't have any power. I don't have any mysterious voodoo juice or. But you couldn't like tell that. us even if you did, right? No, I would. Absolutely. <laughs> I would. And this is exactly why I do these type of interviews to educate, uplift, and inspire people to really have a better understanding of what this really is, because it is fascinating. It is mysterious. It is all of these things that people conjure up in their mind when they hear the word hypnosis. So we get good people out there like myself who take the time and, and say, look, this is what this really is, because if it wasn't, then again, 
I wouldn't have to work for a living. I just hypnotize people all day long for whatever my wants, needs, and desires are. And I would receive them daily. And I wouldn't have to take the time to do anything but enjoy life. Well, there are probably people who do that. So you mentioned Mesmer and Freud. Do, yes. do you know who Edward Bernays is? Bernays. Sounds familiar. Um not not really. So Bernays was Freud's nephew, and he was one of the first people who came up with the idea of public relations. And one of his first public relations campaigns was for Lucky Strike. And Lucky Strike had a problem. Women didn't smoke in public. Half the market gone. Yeah, exactly. And so they needed some way to get women to smoke. And what they did is they hired Edward Bernays and Edward Bernays hired a bunch of models to go to a suffragette protest in New York City. And then he told a bunch of newspapers that the suffragettes were going to light torches of liberty at some point in the parade. In protest. In protest of, I don't know, oppression. And so then he gave these women packs of Lucky Strike cigarettes. And during the parade, they lit up their Torches of Liberty. Torches of Liberty. The photographers took photos. The newspapers wrote about the protest. And women started smoking. Which to me seems like hypnosis. Uh, the structure is absolutely positively getting people to be suggestible and utilizing a campaign to do that. Absolutely, positively, it's exactly what our politicians in the United States of America are doing to persuade, so to speak, people to trust, gain that rapport, and um, get them to vote for where they want them to be. Absolutely, positively, advertises, utilize this power. We all understand that from our human behavior. And psychology will dictate that as well. See, they teach that as well, but they just don't really call it what it is. Mm. It's actually mm. hypnosis and a suggestible or a higher suggestible state where people go into and then they just continue to flood them with the suggestions of what they want them to think. Do you, do you feel like social media networks and Facebook and the internet in general is kind of a form of technological hypnosis. Like is absolutely. the like button. Yeah. Absolutely. Positively, including this program, Indeed. including this Indeed. very, very program. And this is what I tell everyone who's running programs like this, or who's the host of a podcast or TV or whatever it may be. You are actually hypnotists. Mm -hmm. You don't realize it, but in this truest form, you are a hypnotist because you have a successful program people are watching this and you have to ask yourself well why is that happening because you're actually lulling them or hypnotizing them to continue to tune into the next program next program next program why because you have good content you have good guests and your personalities and what it is that you're doing through your creative form is allowing people to keep their attention on this particular program therefore your ratings stay where they are you continue to do the program Case closed. That, so yes, you're doing it too. That is a paralyzing experience, though, because I sit around thinking about that sometimes, and I'm like, "This is not good. We shouldn't be doing this to people. We shouldn't be hypnotizing people. It's bad to hypnotize people." But there's some beautiful forms of hypnosis too, right? Like music is probably one of the most original forms of hypnosis, and it's quite an enjoyable experience. That's well, abso absolutely correct. It, it, I, we utilize hypnosis. Uh, I'm sorry. We utilize music to take people into a hypnotic state. It just helps with that because, again, we're basically in our social environment. Uh, grew up with music. Music is all around us. It also brings back emotional or conscious states of mind immediately. If I play a song from the 1970s that I haven't heard in 10 years, it's going to immediately bring me back to that time when I first heard that song or my first kiss or my girlfriend or whatever it may have been. It's going to, I'm going to recollect that memory pretty quickly. And the music is going to facilitate that. Yeah. So let's talk about sort of the beneficial uses of these altered states and helping people get into them and 
Yeah, convince me that mucking around in people's heads is okay. <laughs> wow. It's going to turn into a therapy session here. <laughs> <laughs> From one head mucker to another. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, again, our mind is like a computer system. And whatever, like I've told you earlier, all behavior is learned behavior. So if behavior is learned, then guess what? We can unlearn it. But our society doesn't put that into our school systems. It, we have to learn these things on our own to understand where do we get these tools to reformat, reprogram our hard drive, which is our brain, to do exactly what it is we want it to do because we're doing negative behavior that's not allowing us to get the fulfillment out of life. Uh, so let's say it's addictions or weight or whatever it may be that's a negative that's prohibiting you from getting you what you want out of life, then this is the tool. And I believe to be, again, I'm biased, the hierarchy of allowing you to reprogram, reformat that computer system, that hard drive in your mind to release the negatives or the negative behavior and to reproduce the positive behavior of what it is you're looking for. But Kevin, you went to school, I assume, right? And you got trained to be a good worker. And how did you stumble upon this idea that you could reprogram your brain or that that was maybe a route that you wanted to get into helping other people? This was not what I was planning on in my earlier days of a younger man. (laughs) And I went to, I did to go to college for this. I did. Um, And I was in between uh, jobs. And anytime I'm in between between anything, I always go back to academia uh, because I always want to feel my mind. I want to learn more. And I just, that's my choices. So I found a college up in uh, California, in Tarzana, California, that actually taught this. And I thought, wow, I'm going to get college credit for it. I've always had an interest in it since I was a boy, I was always fascinated about the mind, how the mind works, mind power, all of these things. And I thought, wow, let me go in, check it out. I'm going to get college credit for this. So I have nothing to lose. And I was in between. So I said, okay. So I signed up and I wasn't going to sign up for the whole program. I was just going to sign up for the basic one-on-one class to learn how to do it. Hypnotism Uh, 101? Hypnotism 101. That's what it was called. I love that. (laughs) I'm going to write that down for later. Drove up the 101 for Hypnotism 101. (laughs) And I actually did, because it is off of the 101 in Tarzana. (laughs) For all you people who are not in California, that's the major uh, freeway up in the valley to get you from point A to B or out of the valley into L.A. So anyway. uh, So you learned a lot? What's that? What did you learn from the academics about this? Or is that how you got trained originally? Uh, but that's exactly 26 years later who I am, <laughs> uh, known as world, known globally and outside of the globe. Uh, the first interstellar guys. hypnotist, yeah. I, I'm now the interstellar hypnotist. There you go. I'm, matter of fact, I'm going to use that. I'm going to put that on my website. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm the globally guy. I'm the guy everyone comes to for the, the answers. I'm the question and answer guy. So every major TV, television program, the doctors, Oprah, all of those programs come to me. I'm that guy. Well, not only because of my passion about what it is that I do, helping people to help themselves, but I'm also a historian and I understand the concepts and again. Again, I continue to dig deeper and deeper into the, 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 the form of this to try and understand it and get others to understand it much more. Because like I said, uh, even to this day, as long as it's been around since the beginning of time, we still don't really understand 100% exactly the science behind it and why it reformats and programs our human behavior. Yeah. So yes, I did go to college for this. I did graduate from college. I got my college credit. Had no idea where life was going to take me until I opened up my private practice and started doing this clinically and the rest was history. And what was your experience with it on the clinical level? Like what is your greatest, do you have a story of your greatest success in terms of clinical therapy? I have many of 26 years. Absolutely. Positively. So did you want to hear one of those stories? Yeah. Yeah. Tell us the story. Absolutely. So you guys talked a little bit about uh, regression earlier in our conversation. So I'm going to give you a little bit of insight as to how regression is uh, possible to help others help themselves. But there's also a part of that that I'm not fully 100% a believer 
into past life regressions. And I've made that down since day one, uh, because this goes hand in hand with the work that I do. And you need to get uh, into a trance state to get into a past life and or a regression uh, to get the individuals in there. So, And this means sort of recalling the past, is that correct? It's sort of like reliving something from the past is the idea of regression? Gotcha. That's correct. Past life regression is where people take themselves and all of a sudden they instantly become uh, George Washington or some famous person. And that they, sounds fun. Live, uh, I mean, it is. And, 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 it's, and, and again, it's very powerful uh, when it comes to helping or health. And I'm going to give you that story mm. uh, as crazy as it sounds, uh, whether or not I believe in the past life regressions, again, which I don't. And there's a lot of a lot of history on that there's a lot of writing on that maybe you guys have interviewed some past life regressionists who exclusively uh do that um not yet i know <laughs> back in the 70s it was very very popular with um oh i forget her name but she's got a lot of books out and she was a famous actress and she did a lot of past life regressions with herself and and others and and back in the 70s this was the thing to do and people were taking themselves in and and discovering all kinds of things but there's no history there's no record there's no scientific evidence of any of it so therefore my stance is is i'm an analytical so you can imagine how difficult it was for me to even understand hypnosis and going into a hypnotic state Mm -hmm. because i would always block it Mm. because i would think myself right out of that situation Mm. so that's what happens with hypnosis it's a natural state but i was always wanting to be in that control of what i thought i was in control of Mm. and so once i understood this i started to use the applications to myself and made a lot of changes and so therefore i convinced myself that hey this stuff does work and then i of course got into private practice clinically helping others and watching those dynamic changes rapidly and quickly through this application. Yeah. So with this regression thing, what's the yes, utility? Hold on, hold on. I want to see, I want to hear the story. And then yeah. Wanna... Isn't the story about regression? Yeah. But not yes. the utility okay. of regression. Yeah. So early in my career, it was probably within the first year of my graduation. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to make a go of this. I really understand it. Uh, I started seeing the changes happening to myself and I said, I'm going to open up a private practice, become, uh, you know, that guy, which everybody knew at the time and what we're known for, but you can, the applications are endless, whatever it is you think about. But at the time, everybody was smoking and weight loss. And that's what people think when they think about hypnotists. Well, I get a call very early on. Once I opened up my private practice, I was pretty excited about it. And I did open it up right off of the 101. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my techniques and, my, and my, my style and who I was started becoming well-known. And uh, that's how I become the, the Hollywood hypnotist guy because my work is with major sports figures, celebrities, and all of these you know, people who are influential in our society. And so they started to come to me. Well, I received this phone call from this very, very wealthy woman in Connecticut. And she had heard about my work. And she said, look, I've got a major pain problem in my left shoulder. And I'm told that you're the person that's going to help me. And I, and I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say yes, you too, know, probably. Jeez, I mean, wealthy lady yeah. in Connecticut calls me up. If there's any yeah. wealthy ladies in Connecticut listening right now, give me a call. M- Mickey will help. <laughs> I'll do it, whatever it is. <laughs> Excellent. So she had been to, she, again, she had the luxury because she was very wealthy to go to every doctor in the world. Uh, every she had been to every specialist every doctor for 40 years and no one could help her with her pain problem that was happening in her shoulder so she said to me i would like to come out i've heard about your work i think you're the person that's going to help me but you know when you get a but there's always a problem right Mm -hmm. (laughs) and in this case it wasn't a problem but she said i wanted to do it past life regression Mm -hmm. and i gave her my my stance on that is as I exactly as I just explained it to you. Uh, my cha- my feelings have not changed in 26 years. Do I feel it's a very strong, powerful modality? Yes. But to me, 
There's no scientific evidence, so I want to know what that is. However, here's the story. So she said, I want to do in the past life regression. And I said, fine, come on out. So she set up a full week to come out when she visited my office in Beverly Hills. And we sat there and the first three sessions were about prepping her, getting her into that state of mind where she needed to be. And then I proceeded to do the past life regression. Again, just because I have a different belief system on how this stuff works doesn't mean I can't facilitate the application. So therefore I did. So her story and her past life regression, and again, it was all about the pain in her shoulder. Her story was real basic, but it was very movie-like, hmm. which most past life regressions become. And her story was this. She was traveling to the West Coast during the gold rush era to get here with her family to strike gold and get gold and all that wonderful thing that was happening in California at that time in the 1800s. Well, they get midway into the United States and the traditional cowboy and Indian fight break out. Indians circle the wagon, the wagon circle, and they get into this giant fight, you know, gunfire, uh, flaming arrows. Well, the flaming arrow, one of them, while they were in the back of the wagon and she was with the children cowering, again, just like a movie or a cowboy TV show, mm -hmm. she's sitting in the back and this flaming arrow gets her right in the shoulder. Well, of course, back in those times, medical technology isn't what it is today. So her healing process wasn't 100%. So she carried this pain in her mind for 40 years. Mm. Every specialist, every doctor, every medication, nothing worked. Mm. Take it through the past life. We properly heal her through hypnosis. She comes out of the state. Lo and behold, pain is now gone. Wow. And did you did you create a narrative in that hypnosis where the doctors back in the 1800s did the right thing and exactly. fixed her shoulder properly? I love your thinking. Absolutely. This is exactly what I did. I took what we know today in our technology and our medical technology and applied it to what was happening in the 1800s mm. so she would heal properly. And in her mind, it received the information and therefore reprogrammed the hard drive, the subconscious mind. And that was it. That's amazing. I actually think there is some interesting scientific evidence about this recently. Quinn, can you tell us, can you remind me who the, uh, the epileptic doctor was? Yeah, so there's a woman whose name is Suzanne O'Sullivan, and she has a book called It's All in Your Head, which sounds inflammatory, but in reality, it's a book written after, I don't know, like 30 years of working as a neurologist with treatment-resistant epileptics in the UK. And what she discovered is that something like 30% of her patients that presented with epileptic symptoms didn't actually have epilepsy they would have seizures they would go through the sort of the arc of epilepsy but they didn't have seizures they had she calls it psychogenic illness which is that there's some kind of trauma you know she goes through the the patient histories for each patient and something terrible has happened to all of them over the course of their lives and the way that that's manifested is that it's manifested in the body and then the brain begins to kind of propagate the illness back exactly. and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so it's hard to tell where does the illness come from, the brain or the body. But when she measures, you know, nervous system activity during a seizure, she's like, well, you're not, this isn't epilepsy. And then when they go to therapy and they see somebody who can actually help them with their problems, then they start to heal for the first time, maybe in their entire lives. Right. Now, there you go. There's Where do they receive the information from or the suggestion from the traumatic experience? Mm -hmm. So therefore, the mind was programmed to know what it knows. Again, mind, the mind does not think for itself. Mm. It has to be told what to do. So either good or bad, positive or negative, the mind is going to receive that information and then carry that through. Now, they came up with a magic number for a conditioning effect, and that magic number is 21. Anytime you establish anything 21 in a row, it's now an automatic in our mind. So that could be, again, positive or negative. doesn't matter to mind because mind doesn't think for itself. It is taught. 
Wait, what's the number 21? I didn't catch that. It's 21. You used 21. it with this patient? Is that what you're saying? I'm sorry? That was the cue with this patient that you were working with? Oh, no, 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 no. no. That, uh, we, 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 she was talking about the epilepsy and the traumatic experience and mm. how the mind received the information. So therefore, when you get a traumatic experience, that 21 becomes instant because it's traumatic. So the mind identifies with that immediately. 21 years of age? No, no, 21 times in a row, anything oh. consecutive. Oh, yeah. so you're saying that you basically have to have something happen a number of times in order for it to basically go from being just something unpleasant to being a uh, trauma. Or, 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 or opposite. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So 21 is that magic number. And who came up with that number? Well, I'm sure you've heard of Pavlov's dog. Mm. His dog yeah. came up with a number? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, if you want to say so. Uh, well, Pavlov's dog, we'll go into the history very briefly and give you the Reader's Digest version. Basically, Dr. Pavlov, he was training a, a, an animal, a dog, to uh, understand human behavior and psychology. So basically, what he would do is take the dog and basically train it to be only hungry when the dog would hear a bell ring. And he basically was successful once he got to that magic number of 21. So the conditioning process of 21 and conditioning the dog, training the dog to only be hungry and salivate when the bell would ring, that was the success. So they applied that to human behavior and they started testing that and studying it. And so that's the magic number, so to speak. It's not for everybody. It's kind of a, it's a format that, um, you know, we go to for the basics to understand how it may or may not work, but then everybody's the same. But basically, 21 is the magic number. Once you establish it 21, good or bad, it's now an automatic in your brain, and your brain thinks, therefore. And so pattern breaking is important for being able to kind of restructure the mind one way or another, right? So if you have a 21 version pattern that points to it being bad, then if you can break that and move it to, do you have to move it to 21 times being good? Do like you, not smoking cigarettes 21 times or something? Yeah, like you have the urge 21 times to smoke and you don't, and then you're cured, or what is that? Yeah, it would definitely help uh, with that basic structure. But no, you want to aim for programming the mind where it thinks it's 21, or you actually physically do the 21. Mm. Yeah. And then you'll get some success. But again, everyone's different. Uh, depends on the personality, the you know how they receive information, how they communicate. So that's just a, a basic foundation of what you want to build from uh, when you have a patient come in and decide what way you're going to go with them. Mickey, By the way, what were you going to ask about regression? I was just trying to understand uh, whether it was only referring to past lives or not. But what I wanted to ask is, is this patient, uh, this wealthy lady from Connecticut, who should give me a call, by the way, is she doing all right these days? Or did, did she stay cured? Or, you know, how did it hold out? Did you have to have follow-up sessions? Did she have some self version of this that she could take home with her? Yes. Great questions. I love you guys. You guys are doing your research. <clears throat> so... This was many years ago. I, like I said, it was earlier on in my career. I've been doing this for 26 years. So, um, yes, I did do some follow-up with her because, again, even my own analytical mind wanted to make sure or understand what this process was really happening with her with the past life regression. Because and then I it wasn't just a fluke. Um, no, because I went on to do, and I still do, past life regressions uh, and helping people with that modality in different areas. But you asked for a story, and I gave you a story of what will be impactful. I can give you many more, but this one was earlier in my career, and I was still naive and really didn't understand a whole lot about that process. I understood hypnosis, and I understand how, the, how to utilize those applications, but to combine that with a past life and do all these other modalities to get that particular patient from A to B and where she wanted to be, which was pain free, was very fascinating. And of course, uh, my na my naiveness and where I was, I of course did many many weeks of follow up, and uh, I think even after two years after she had come in for her sessions to see where she was really at with that and how the programming worked with the hypnosis. Yes, and she was successful. Yeah. What sort of self-hypnosis regimens did you offer her to take home? Did she get like a 
to go bag. <laughs> yeah, she got the swag. A self hypnosis <laughs> burrito. She, she yeah, she got the Hollywood hypnotist swag bag. What um, what happened was I always uh, give my patients. Uh, you can get that on my website as well. There's a self-hypnosis CD to learn the applications of to take yourself in and take yourself out of hypnosis. So everyone always gets that. Is that sort of like meditation? Yes. Yes, it's very parallel to meditation or yoga or praying. Um, all of these are basically the same state. Of course, I, I definitely feel that hypnosis is the hierarchy because I've tried all of the other ones. Mm. And with hypnosis, this is where you're in control. Again, it's kind of hard for people to wrap their mind around this because when they hear the word hypnosis, they think, oh, I'm going to lose control. Actually, when you're in a hypnotic state, you're more in control than you are in a normal conscious state of mind mm. or a meditative state or any of the other states that people want to get into because you're controlling the state. You're controlling the environment. You're controlling all, everything that's around you. And as you know, it doesn't matter where you are on this planet. We live in a very negative society. Mm. So there's a lot of negative energy. There's a lot of negatives around us. And we're absorbing these negatives all the time. And so therefore, when you're in a hypnotic state, you're actually controlling everything around you. So the state is much more powerful. And then when you come in and come out of it, your brain can be formatted or changed quicker than any of the other states. Kevin, have you ever hypnotized somebody out of something very acute, like a headache or a fever or something like that? Oh, yeah. That's the easy stuff. Huh. Mm, absolutely. Yes. Do you know yeah. Wim Hof? No. Who is Wim Hof? Wim Hof is this uh, sort of wild... Iceman character who does all these feats of endurance without really getting in shape or anything. He'll just go and, you know, try to, he'll climb like Everest or walk through the desert without water. And he sort of chalks it all up to mind over matter, which would be kind of interesting. But what's happened recently is that some scientists in the Netherlands have studied him. We actually had the chance to interview one of these scientists, which is pretty cool. And they've actually found that he can control his inflammatory response to bacterial endotoxins and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, he can really, you know, get a grip on these automatic processes in his body that seem kind of anecdotal until now. But they started doing these measurements of biomarkers in his blood. And they're like, yeah, he's actually doing it. Like the guy can actually prevent himself from getting a fever and he can teach it to other people. So I wonder if there's like, It'd be really cool to see if you could hypnotize people into also controlling these sort of things. Like you seemed, you're like, yeah, you can hypnotize people out of a headache, no problem. It's like, man, I bet there's scientists that'd be really interested in measuring that. Well, they have. Um, and again, that's when you learn basic hypnosis, that's the stuff that they teach you because that's the easier things that people are more receptive to mm. and the mind will receive that information. But just like the gentleman you're talking about, uh, I thought it was maybe a, cart a cartoon character or something, but that's a real person, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's kind of a cartoon too, but he's, he, he's, that's a... true. he's from the Netherlands. Yeah. And he's absolutely utilizing his mind power. Absolutely. Positively. Is he using the applications of hypnosis? Yes. Probably doesn't realize that he is. He's just doing it naturally or he's gifted to do that. But is he utilizing all of that? Absolutely. Positively. Cause again, the mind and physical body are connected and the only way to control any of the things that you're talking about is through the mind. So he's using utilizing these applications. It'd be fascinating to, you know, dig a little bit deeper into what it is that he is doing or find out. Um, I'm probably going to do some research on him because I'm already fascinated, but I already know when I, when I uncover the research, he's utilizing uh, d different techniques, probably hypnosis, neurolinguistic programming, all these different things to convince his mind to do these physical feats. Absolutely. I think you'd really love him. And what's kind of amazing is that he can teach it to other people too. And so it's been a real cool vehicle for scientists who are trying to figure out how it is that the brain or the mind, how it is that the mind affects the rest of the body. And they've uncovered some really cool findings. I think about the, the relationship between the adrenal glands which kind of ties in back to the stage show stuff too, I imagine. And the ability to really control these automatic processes and 
Uh, it's really fascinating stuff. I think well, you'll think you'll like it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and, on, and on that theme, uh, we've done incredible, and they've done incredible research with cancer and other things uh, with white blood cells and, and healing blood cells and all, all of these things uh, with the power of the mind and, and the applications of hypnosis to facilitate that. Absolutely. So call it what you want. Again, at the end of the day, it's that mind power. It's hypnosis. It's suggestibility. It's uh, allowing your mind to do what you want to do and you controlling that and not allowing it to control it for you. You see, we all, we all um, as humans, our behavior is we want to take the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And so we all want that easy way. So this is some work. You have to actually, you know, think. You have to allow yourself to go into a process. It's not like you just blank out. And so that's what hypnosis is. Yeah. I want to go back to something that you said earlier, which was that there is a way to prevent yourself from being hypnotizable. You know, you said that you have this really strong analytic tendency that you actually had to talk yourself out of. Right. And the trance state seems like it's an intuitive part of human nature, maybe even animal nature. But there's something special about humans, which is that you can talk yourself out of an intuitive trance state. How do you do that? Because you're constantly surrounded as a human, it seems like, with people that are trying to hypnotize you. And like you were saying, it's a negative, there's often a negative culture. There's this, you know, negative emotions hit so much harder than positive ones. And they're being used to sell you things and sway your vote. And what can people do to protect themselves against that? Yes. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Because even when uh, people come visit me at my clinic, I actually have to dehypnotize them and then to <laughs> rehypnotize them so they're only suggestible to themselves and not necessarily the environment. Mm-hmm. Because as you know, the environment can be negative, right? And again, our the way our makeup is, our human conditioning, uh, let me keep it simple, where the, the old terminology, the, the, the squeaky oil always gets, uh, the, the squeaky wheel always gets the oil, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so it's the one who, who is screaming the loudest is the one we pay attention to because we want it to go away and we want it to stop. And so it's the same principle of what you're talking about, what your question is, because we are so bombarded daily with suggestion all around us, everything we do. The moment, even in our own homes, <laughs> we're, 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 we're suggestible to what is happening. So, so if it's a toxic environment, guess what? You're, you're becoming suggestible to that and you carry that outside. Mm-hmm. And it becomes the domino effect where everyone becomes infected by this. And so you really have to stay in the zone, in, in, in that frame of mind where you're completely positive and you're controlling exactly your own destiny, so to speak, to be what it is that you want it to be. But you need these tools. And so this is that tool to help you to stay focused, concentrated on things that you want to achieve out of life. So it sounds like what you're saying is that getting rid of the trance state isn't actually possible. Like it's not possible to prevent yourself from going into a trance state. What's important is finding ways to make sure that the trance state is working for you rather than working for someone else. Exactly. And let's break it down, the simplicity of it. All of us three right here and other people viewing this program or listening to this program, we're in the trance state because we're talking to each other right now Here's our deep trance state between the three of us. Have you really thought about anything else? Have you thought about, oh, I've got to go somewhere at 7 p.m. and I've got a dinner reservation? You haven't thought about any of those things. You thought about where you are right here, the here and now. And that's sort of the hallmark of a good conversation, actually. It seems like if you're really, you know, really trying to understand somebody, like you wouldn't have time to think about all those other things. Yeah. Again, the simplicity of the trance state. You're in the trance state. Automatic. Because you're focused and concentrated on exactly where you are, the here and now. Mm. And that's the simplicity of it. Oh, that's fascinating because it would seem that all of the technology that's available to people, you know, the cell phones and YouTube and Netflix and everything else is kind of a mechanism for getting them out of the here and now, right? 
in some way? No, it's actually opposite. Hmm. It's taking them deeper into a, the trance and again programming programming them and guiding them wherever that is and that's becoming the digression of our society is technology because people are so engrossed i mean just look at go, go sit on any city or any park bench and just watch people are they engaging with each other any longer no they're engaging with their technology but it's kind of not really off. here and now, right? I think that's what Quinn's saying. It's like it's like they're they're lost in some cyberspace that's neither where they're at or right. happening. Provoked, provoked by the technology. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And that's kind of the trance state. That so it seems like on one level the trance state is equivalent to the flow state. Have you heard of that before? Yes, absolutely. Matter of fact, that 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 terminology was uh, very, very popular back in the eighties. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah. so, but and so, do you think that there's a relationship between the trance state and the flow state? Absolutely. Yeah. All of this is parallel. Everything we're talking about when we talked about meditative states or all those other questions, all of that is parallel. It's all parallel. It's like religion. You know, you have your your Jewish religion, you have your Catholic religion, you have your Christian religion, and you, I can go on and on. Uh, is it, are they all doing basically, essentially the same thing? It's all parallel, mm -hmm. but they just have different ways of going about it with their belief system. So I hope that simply answers the question of what you just asked, because it's the same thing. But again, we have to find what works for us. So I always tell people when they come to my clinic that, you know, finding a good therapist and the analogy I've always used is like was for me when I first uh, was trying to find a dry cleaner. Now, there's many dry cleaners on <laughs> every corner in, in the United States of every town. But and they all do the same thing, but they don't do all the same thing. Their basics is all the same thing, but you have to find the one that's right for you. So it's the same kind of concept. And I hope that really resonates with people in their mind as to how this really works as well. So everything we're talking about, does it work? Sure, it works. Just like all the stop smoking products or losing weight products that are on the market that they were bombarded by daily with advertising in the media. Does it work? Sure, it works. But it's temporary. It's a placebo. It doesn't last because you're not programming the computer. Mm. There's a there's an right. external locus of control in all of those examples, right? Absolutely. And Absolutely. the difference yes. between the flow state and the hypnotic trance state that's put on by all of these things that you mentioned is the place where the sort of the control is originating from, it sounds like. Yeah, that's correct. And Orianta Medicine understands that more than traditional uh, medicine here in the United States. Yes. Is that just because it's a difficult thing to package and charge um, insurance no, companies I, I for? Think, I think it's mindset. I think it's, again, the society, how we're taught different. Uh, again, it's just different information and how it's processed. Yeah. So when people are walking around and they're exposed all their lives to media, especially kids, I think about this right now, and, you know, I've started to get interested in history, which I think means I'm getting old. And so now I started thinking about... <laughs> How do you associate with, with understanding and getting into history as getting old? I'm fascinated by that, quite, by that statement. Well, you're think, tired of the now. Yeah. Well, like, oh, think, what happened before? I think that when you're a kid, you hear the statement that, you know, those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it. And you're kind of like, whatever, history doesn't matter. We're going to make something new. And then you get older and you're like, man, those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it. And then you start looking at history because you're trying to figure out how to avoid the same mistakes. Yeah. But when you're young, I think that you don't really get a sense that the mistakes that are being made are the same ones that have already been made over and over again. I think um, that's what I mean. Okay. I'm going to go with that for your, from where you stand and where your mindset is, because I think that's a generalization. I certainly didn't think that way when I was a boy. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. <laughs> I'm a late bloomer. What can I say? <laughs> but it seems like 
people are being born right now and are being actively programmed by the constant availability of technology, right? It's always there. You see kids on these Informational technology, you mean, right? Info technology, yeah. And I suppose you could say the same thing about the printing press, but there's something... There's some ingredient of difference between a book, which has a start and a finish, and the internet, or the infinite scroll of social media. You know, these are different things. And so I think they're doing different things to the brain. Oh, absolutely. Positively. And it's digression. And it's uh, allowing our society to get more and more digressed and less communicative and less anything. Um, uh, The biggest uh, thing that happens in my clinic is parents calling me because of the pandemic of video games Mm -hmm. and how everyone has their heads, including not just young adults. We're talking adults. I get calls from wives and spouses and all kinds of things of this technology of gaming is uh, allowing people to escape. But it's, again, that digression is not allowing them to, to maintain status quo in our society. So they don't know how to communicate anymore. They don't know how to socialize. They don't know how to do many things because their head is in a video game or the internet or whatever else we want to label just label it all technology. Um, so that's the digression of what is happening with all of these things that are that are out there. Seems like those are only going to get better and more appealing. Do you, Absolutely. Do you think that Absolutely, it's... Absolutely, because the bottom line is they're making, somebody's making money off of it. So as long as mm. it de- derives that and follow the money, follow the problem. Well, I, I actually just saw this link to a new product that Google is developing, which is basically VR video calling. And they're marketing as a way for, you know, people that are stuck in different places to be able to talk to each other in a way that's more realistic. But what it comes right. down to is it's basically a Hollywood booth, right? It's got all these lights. It's got all these cameras. You sit down in it. Somebody on the other end has an equivalent booth. And it seems like they're in the room with you without actually being in the room with you. Right. And that's the direction, right? So it's going to get, the hypnosis is going to get even stronger. It's going to, the pull to leave your own state is going to be stronger and stronger with each passing year. So what can people do? I think that's the central question. How do people fight against this? Each passing minute. uh, TikTok. That's the impact. That's the impact. And, you know, the great thing is, again, uh, not to put down technology or ha- have anybody formulate this negativity about it, because, again, it's all for positive. It's all to benefit us and to make our lives easier and to, to communicate faster and quicker and all of that great stuff. And just mm-hmm. like anything else, and if we go back to biblical principle um, and we go back to Adam, who was the founder of all of this as to why we are where we are today, it's the same thing. And you talk about history repeating itself. Well, here it is. It's cyclical. And so technology is good like anything else, but there's good and bad. Mm -hmm. So you have to really decipher and define and weed through all of this to try and understand, is it good and how, and everything is in balance and moderation to abuse it or overuse it is where the issues start. And so how to block that, how to, how, to, how to understand that? Well, exactly what it is that I'm saying is to really just step back and realize, you know, how much of this am I doing and why am I doing it that much? Again, moderation, balance, take your, learn, learn tools, learn tools like hypnosis or, mm-hmm. or meditation or, or, or do something that's going to continue to fuel and benefit the mind. So therefore your mind can continue to grow and not get stuck in a video game or, or a format or, or the things that are good that are feeding us, feeding our ego, feeding our physical body, all of that. What are these other things? These are the other things. Get into a healthy program. Go to the gym. Get outside. Do all of these things that base, were the basic fundamentals of life back in the early days of our history of humans and take advantage of those. That's the secret. There's, it's, not, it's not a riddle. It's not a mystery. It's not complex. This is the simplicity of it. It's really just stepping back and looking in the mirror and understanding where you're at 
Mm-hmm. With all of these things that are happening, are you overwhelmed with technology? Are you overwhelmed with what is happening? And what do I need as a tool to help me to counteract and fight the good fight? Do you think it's possible to live without addictions? Wow. I don't think... And this is just off the top because I, I, that's an, uh, an amazing question. And I don't think anyone's ever really thought about that or even pondered it. I, 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 I'm I think getting Quinn means first. something sort of broad <laughs> here by addictions too. You're talking about that negative programming stuff, right? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. No, there's positive addictions mm-hmm. as well. Mm. Yeah, It's not necessarily always negative. Again, see when we hear the word addiction, oh, it's negative. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a horrible word for me. I, I never know what anybody means by it. I'm like... Am I addicted right. to air? Like, what's going on? I, I don't know. You just did great. You asked him to, you asked to identify it, to clarify. So there you go. Um, I, and I took it as, as she was asking as in a positive way. Um, so as humans, I do not believe we can live without addiction. Uh, no, positive or negative. It's not in our DNA. It's not in our makeup. It's not how God designed us. I just don't know. I mean, it's That's interesting. Just off the cuff. I have no research. Just <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I have not done the studies on this, but I yeah. think not. It's my first impulse with that one. Well, yeah, it's sure. mine as well because I find myself constantly. You know, I'll have a bad habit, and I find that the only way to get rid of that bad habit, I think about it sometimes like a piece of gum. You know, you get a piece of gum stuck to something, mm-hmm. and you can kind of only get rid of it by sticking it to something else. Wow. That's a great analogy, actually. Yeah. And so I I agree. That's kind of, it feels like that is what messing with your brain is like. It has all these sticky points. Yeah. But you don't want to get, you don't want to stick it to something else. You want to claim that responsibility before you stick it to something else. Well, you want to make sure you stick it to something good, right? Yeah. You're like, you don't want to like go stick it on the underside of like a table and, you know, get somebody else to scrape it off. So it seems like with all these temptation mind sinks sort of multiplying in the world right now of the humans, it's really interesting that the fundamental problem you're tracing it back to this sort of ancient biblical roots. And to that end, it seems like religion has never been less popular on earth than it is right now. And it's almost like the problems are multiplying, but the solution has sort of disappeared because, you know, rationalism and everything. So what do you see? How are people going to actually come upon these skills or like, is it sort of every man for himself kind of situation in the future on earth where, you know, hopefully no, people can find uh, their no, way to this, these ancient ideas cool. or, you know, because if the basic fundamental ideas is, is sort of really old, how will people come across it if it's been cast away? Yeah. Uh, um, first of all, we are built to be reliant. And again, we go back to biblical terminology and scripture. We are built that way. And so if that's what you believe and that's what you understand, because when you get to a point in life and I'll use, I'll use her words where I'm getting older. So I'm trying to decipher what <laughs> life is really about and where I'm going to go. Right? Well, some of us started at five years old. Some of us start at 50 years old and they start to ponder life because their life is coming to an end. So they start to realize what is this all this about? Right. Um, so it depends on the person, but um, we are dependent and we are reliant not only on each other, uh, so there'll never be this anarchy uh, completely. It will it will be temporary, but we will end up realizing where the higher power is and trying to understand the higher power and establishing that relationship mm-hmm. because that's where it truly is. Because we're not built any other way. We're built to become reliant. So you basically have a lot of faith that people will just, will sort of in feeling pushed around by all these psychic powers, they'll sort of seek out solutions on their own. Well, that's the unfortunate part with our society. We're taught the basics in our school systems, in our society. Um, it's up to the individual to seek out all of these other things to understand them and what life really is, because there's so much more out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people stop. They become complacent um, and they get comfortable and they stop at that point and they never seek out anything. Um, but I truly believe we're designed as humans to continue that quest, no matter what, even when when you become lazy or complacent, you still have that little itch in the back of your mind or in your head 
telling you, uh, we should look into that, or I should think about that, or I should really research that. So I, I really believe that's how we're designed. And so it's really up to the individual. And that's free will. That's what we're designed to have is free will. So it's really any individual. And the responsibility becomes ours. Absolutely. And for someone who is interested in understanding more about hypnosis and educating themselves without necessarily going down the path of starting to hypnotize themselves, do you have any texts or resources that you think are good historical places to start for, you know, the like hypnosis 101 off the 101? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, always, always, and which is again becoming a, a dying uh, breed, so to speak, is to go to your public library. Mm. And there's lots of great information in there. If you can find a public library, and if you can find one that's open still, <laughs> that's um, because again, the depravity of that uh, is is appalling to me well but your public library is absolutely positively wealth of information and knowledge of course you can get into your technology and get into google and bring up all kinds of information about the applications and the modalities of hypnosis or just go to my website because i've made it simple for people over the years getting amazing questions like the ones you've been bringing up uh for 26 years i finally decided you know what i'm just going to answer those questions for people and let them make up their own mind as to what they think or not think with my experience and my background and so all that information is up on my website free of charge just go ahead and go get into it learn about it and if you have any questions you can contact me um, i answer my own emails I'll, I'll get back to you i might not get back to you as quickly as you would want me to but i will definitely get back to you and answer your questions if that's something you're very interested in and learning more about Awesome. That's awesome. Uh, we will put your website in the description for the show. That would be fantastic. Yeah. And not, not for me, it's for the, for the people. Because again, this is what I do. This is my passion in life, helping people to help themselves. I'm a guide. I'm a facilitator. I don't have any powers. I don't have any mysterious uh, you know, things. Uh, I'm human, just like everyone else. And my gifts and my abilities is to educate, uplift, and inspire people to understand this modality utilize this modality it's a natural organic resource to improve your life it's that simple i love Beautiful. that uh, all right well thank you so much it was well, a pleasure talking guys. to you absolutely this was a lot of fun you brought up some amazing in-depth questions oh you're so kind i'm even going to ponder and think about because i think you guys have great thinking Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye. 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 Bye.